Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Movie Mates podcast. I am Matthew, joined by my wonderful co-host and best friend. Helen. Hey man, great to see you as always. So today we're back with um, episode 55, I think, of the podcast, and we've got another themed episode for you guys. It's crime films, or uh, American crime films more specifically. So I'm going to pass over to my good buddy Callum, and he's going to explain what, mo- what four movies we're going to be talking about today. So Callum, off to you, mate. Yes, so I, I believe we'll be calling the episode just, uh, let, let's just throw out crime in case, you know, so we can do a, a part a part one, part two situation and, you know, we can just cover whatever films we want to next episode. Sure. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be talking about four films today, coincidentally all from the 90s. Uh, that was not in my consideration when I when I picked out the films for today. Uh, but we're going to be starting with Goodfellas, then moving on to The Fugitive, which is, isn't really a crime film in, in a way, you know, it's it's more a... Well, like, it is a fugitive on the run. Like, would you, would you class that as a crime film? Okay, yeah, I haven't I, seen I it. Suppose. Yeah, I definitely haven't seen it. I would say it's definitely got a lot because it is. In many ways, it is like a cop. The cops chase the fugitive in, in many ways. So I suppose yeah, it's definitely a crime film for sure, man. For yeah, sure. but it, like re- really, uh, at its root, it's more you know action film slash mystery. Yeah, uh, rather than crime thriller, film. So yeah, yeah. yeah, you know. So I I regret choosing it for this theme, but I really enjoyed watching it. Then moving on to the usual suspects and finishing with Heat. So we, we have some pretty iconic films today, uh, you know, as, as we've been trying to do quite recently, you know, co- cover all the, the, the big hitters of, of cinema, you know, whilst we're in lockdown as well. Uh, well, e- easing of lockdown at this <laughs> point, but, you know, uh, you know, know we're getting around to watching some of, some of the films that we've really wanted to. Uh, so, Matthew, what was your film experience today? Yeah, so I had a, I had a good experience with these films. Um, this is my first time watching all of them, I believe. Uh, yeah, it was the first time I watched all of them. And I sort of, I, I want to get more into watching like the classic crime films like uh, Scarface and like the, well, you, the big four in my opinion would be like Goodfellas, Scarface, then Godfather part one and part two. I would say like there's the big four like gangster films. So I was really glad to have Goodfellas and sort of check that off my list as well. And you know, a lot of these films we sort of have covered uh, you know, we've covered other De Niro films before, you know, King of Comedy. We've, we've covered other, that's another Scorsese film and stuff. And, you know, we've covered other Kevin Spacey films with American Beauty. So I think there's going to be a lot of overlap here with certain points that we're going to make. But it's going to be a good one, man. It's going to be a good one. You know, this these films are, um, these films were a good time for me. What about yourself, bro? How was your experience? Yeah, I, I had a really good time. We're going to be, we're going to talk about one that sort of tested my patience uh, and that I, I didn't, by, by the end, I didn't love as much as I expected to, but I expected to have a really good time. Uh, with these films and i did that's great man that's great but yeah as um just before we kick off the podcast guys thank you to everyone who has supported us recently and we really do appreciate it, honestly and please be sure to like um subscribe it and comment your thoughts on these crime films down below we'd love to hear your thoughts as always and if you have any questions or just podcast suggestions in general email us at movie podcast at gmail.com and as we said you know in our previous episodes we're still looking for if you have any suggestions for like name changes for the channel or anything like that um, crack on and leave your suggestions in the comments section or whatever. So, um, yeah, uh, Callum, shall, shall we kick off with Goodfellas then, dude? Yes. So this is probably. W- would you say the most famous of the four films we're oh, talking yeah. about today, or would you say, or would you say the Usual Suspects? Ooh, hmm. it's a, it's a both. Of, well, yeah, I'd say both of them are probably definitely close to each other. But the, this film, especially like the poster, um, which I think we're hopefully going to use for the thumbnail, um. Like the poster for that film was pretty iconic in itself as well, and I suppose Martin Scorsese, you know, was pretty, pretty uh, famous guy. Yeah, I would say that you know this is probably the most quintessential in relation to the crime genre that we're talking today. But you know, maybe The Usual Suspects is the more regarded film. Mm, yeah, no, that's true, man. That definitely, and um, yeah, like this film is definitely like it's definitely more in terms of like crime films. You know, it's definitely towards more like gangster mobster. Um, sort of seen as uh, compared to the other ones, so it's it's a it's a, it was a great a great time with this man. But what are your overall thoughts just before we crack on? Well, just to sort of talk about expectations, uh, like speaking of characters, uh, I sort of pictured you know the, the idea of like the lovable rogue. You know, I thought, ooh, you know, yeah, they're they're criminals, but you know, we're gonna <laughs> yeah. we're gonna learn to love them. Yeah. But I think the brutality <clears throat> of the opening scene where they like finish off bats by uh, Tommy stabbing him violently in the back of the car. Uh, I just think that sort of immediately ruled out any sympathy we would have towards the characters. Man, that's such an interesting point because I actually thought, you know, the De Niro character, uh, Jimmy, was going to be the main character. Because it's weird because in the poster of the film, he is the main guy. But in this film, it's actually um, 
it's actually Hen- Henry, isn't it? Who's the main character? And that was surprising. And so sort of subverted that, you know, he's the, he's the new mobster and the gangster, like come, rising up through the ranks. And it was a really refreshing take to see. And I, I thought it was fantastic. But no, I, I know what you mean, dude. Like it definitely does um, lessen your sympathy for them uh, by the end of the film when the brutality of what they do to people, you know, when they just, yeah. No, I know what you mean, man, completely. And uh, the film actually earned uh, Joe Pesci an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. But I think really the, hi- the highlight of the film is Ray Liotta as Henry. Mm. And I think that he gives some of the most audibly soothing voiceover I've ever heard. Yeah, it's, I have, a, I have a, the, same no- uh, the same notes I've written down here. Like, th- this is one instance where narration really adds to a film, I think. You know, I, I think um, the Henry character is, is fantastic. And you know, there's so many iconic lines in this film as well, isn't there? And the Henry character, he's actually given a lot of character development as well, which, which surprised me, to be honest. Did, did you think he was just going to be sort of like a one, like a one note like audience yeah. uh, like yeah. point of view character? Yeah, because you know when you see when you see these films and they're based on real life people, you sort of think there's only so much they can do with their character. But I think you know when you hear stories of De Niro describing look, they had real gangsters on set and stuff for films like this, and then for films like Heat, it really adds to it. You know, it it, it really feels authentic, and I thought it was just fantastic. Yeah, and I haven't seen The Wolf of Wall Street, but I, I don't know, from what I've seen of it, it is, you know, directly, like, you know, it's it's also directed by Martin Scorsese, but it seems almost like a parody of this film, even in Leonardo DiCaprio's voiceover, because he sounds identical to Ray Liotta, <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know what it is, but they yeah. sound exactly the same. Uh, and, you know, I think, uh, I mean, you know, the last film that we watched with voiceover was The Kissing Booth 2, uh, you know, <laughs> so this was probably just there's probably just a welcome, a welcome change where, you know, you <laughs> yeah. don't actually actively hate the character. I mean, even though you should, I, I actually like this character more than I do L. Evans, just putting it out there. No, no, me too, me too. You know, I, as we said, sort of Joe Pesci had got, not, uh, had won for Best Supporting Actor, and I think he definitely, along with um, Joe, uh, as, along with uh, Henry, um, I think, you know, fantastic performances. But yeah, I, I, have, I have my notes here. You know, Joe Pesci as Tommy gives a performance of the film, in my opinion. You know, he, he really does, like, he's fantastic. And he sort of, he gets killed, way, like, not early on, but maybe, like, two-thirds of the way through it. It's sort of, like, I don't know, I felt sort of a bit left down there. I, I would have liked to have seen him in for the full, full run time. I mean, I was asking very early on, how has someone not murdered him? Because they sort of have, <laughs> have this honour code where you're not meant to murder members of other families. Or, you know, you're not meant to murder... Uh, you know, members of your family, yeah. like your crime family, but he hadn't actually been made, uh, as they say here. So, you know, he, was, he wasn't actually an official gang member. So they could have easily killed him and he would have been a lot less of a liability because, yeah. you know, he seems to have murdered several good men who are members of, uh, well, not, not members of the family as, you know, they're sort of just rising through the ranks. Uh, but, you know, he, he kills several, like, high-quality subordinates. Yeah, it kind of gets you thinking about what sort of, about like the real life mafia and all these like crime families and stuff in America at the time, like it is a brutal business. You know, there's absolutely no no sort of loyalty at, at all. They have no qualms about about killing each other, and that's really highlighted in sort of heat as well. Um, but you know, in, in this film, like it just goes to show how little loyalty gangsters have for one another. You know, they just kill each other in the fear of the knowledge about their acts being leaked. You know, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. And Matthew, like, do, do you find it odd that every single film with Robert De Niro tries to convince us that he's, like, exceptionally young? Like, you know, in The King Comedy, he's very clearly in his, like, thir- late 30s, 40s, and they're like, oh, this, this, tw- like, this 20 something year old man. Yeah. And, you know, in, the, in this film, they, they say, like, oh, you know, when, when I met uh, Jimmy Conway, he was, he was just a, a 29 year old boy, and then just Robert De Niro with, like, slicked back black hair rocks in. Yeah. Like, it's, it's the least convincing I've ever seen. Yeah, and uh, that sort of adds to the comedy of the film, which was another huge surprise that this film is, in essence, like, a comedy. Oh, it is. In many ways, it is. Yeah, like, the film, what it does really well, it adds lighthearted music to really intense scenes. And I think it sort of does that ju- sort of juxtaposition between the music and, and the scene really well. Like, it is very funny. And also, like, this film it has the most, like, fucks I've ever heard in my life. There's so much swearing in this, and I, I, I thought it was great. It, yeah, it's ninety percent Joe Pesci, and I, I love yeah, every part of well, it. Absolutely, did absolutely. And you know, sort of, uh, the, there's an ethos that is given by Jimmy Conway to Henry Hill early in the film when he's pinched for the first time, 
and he he gives him uh, the these two rules of engagement that are never rat on your friends and keep your mouth shut. Seem like the vet, seem like the same in policy. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, they do. Uh, they, I, I think they do one one equals the other. Yeah, that's true, man. And you know, one thing I love about this film is how like Henry's, Tommy's, and Jimmy's. I'll say that three times fast. Uh, like Henry, Tommy, and Jimmy's crimes, they all get progressively more serious as the film goes on. Like they start off as like, you know, like like they rob trucks and stuff and they supply it from trucks and stuff and, you know, the, like hijack cars and stuff. But then it progresses into murder very quickly. And I think the film does it really well. Like the severity of being a, a gangster in that time, especially in, and when's the film set? Like, well, it jumps, but I think it's like they start off 55 and then the, their peak is like the early 70s. So it just goes to show you like, you know, this, this stuff that happened in real life with Henry Hill, it is, it, it's crazy. Like it, it's, you wouldn't really believe it. Yeah. And I would say the craziest and most famous scene from the film is uh, Joe Pesci's scene where he asks, funny how, funny like I'm a clown, do I yeah. amuse you? Yeah. And yeah. I can just, I can just say if someone that crazy was asking me that kind of question, I'd just shit myself. Yeah. I would be so terrified. <laughs> yeah. You're a funny guy. What do you mean I'm a funny guy? Like it is, it's such a great scene. It's such a great scene. And you know, another line that I thought was really, really weird was, you know, when, when Henry beats a guy's head in with a gun and then um, his wife Karen goes, I gotta admit the truth. It turned me on. And I was just like, okay, that's a, that's a weird line, but I love it. I don't know. It sort of seemed like a, like a Stella a Stella Stanley situation, situation yeah. <laughs> so uh, where, where she's like thrilled by his violence. But at least he was never violent towards her until that point. Until that uh, point, later yeah. in the later in the film, he does uh, move on to domestic violence. And you know, I sort of really like the character of Henry for maybe two thirds of the film. And then when he starts cheating on his wife and starts abusing his wife. I turned very quickly, but I think the film still wants you to like him, which I, which I didn't really understand. Like, they, was there was there a point where that sort of switched for you? You know, I have to agree with you, man. To be honest with you, you know, I I I definitely do think because you know the actual Henry Hill was involved in this. I think he would definitely said, you know, make me to the like to the producers and stuff, make me more likable. There's a hundred percent that that conversation would have happened. I reckon, and. Um, yeah, no, I have to agree with you. I think uh, just because of the severity of his actions towards himself and his wife, you know, it's sort of, yeah, it's it's just it's just mad, man. It's mad. You know, there's there's one line in here as well, which you know, when Henry says like Karen finally got her mother to put her house up so I could get bail. I was just like, Jesus, that's yeah, what it's a like piece her of house, shit. Her house just so we can get bail. That is mad. Yeah, like I, I I definitely agree with you that Henry Hill must have had an influence where he's like, yeah, yeah, maybe make me feel better. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't think he I don't think he commits a single murder in this film. I think he he's beats a there. bunch of guys and he's like he's a witness to murder and he buries bodies, but I don't think he ever actually pulls the trigger. And you're definitely not surviving in the in the mob or the gang world without without murdering people. Oh, yeah. So he, no, that's so true, he man. Yeah. absolutely must have. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I definitely think that there is a an air of his influence throughout the film. Without doubt, man, without doubt. And, you know, we've sort of talked about how, you know, the, the Karen and Henry e relationship is quite toxic. And I think it was toxic pretty much from the first date. It was so disastrous. I have no idea why she was so intent on, like, strolling around town to find him, to complain mm -hmm. about the fact he had stood her up. It's like, you know, you, yeah. you clearly didn't like him on the first date. He was a piece of shit. Take the hint, walk away. And mm -hmm. I think that she probably would have lived a much, much healthier and better life. Uh, you know, maybe less wealthy, but definitely a higher quality of living. Yeah. Uh, so you, yeah, that's so true. I've I've no idea why she wanted to pursue that. That's so you've smashed it there, Callum. To be honest with you, bro, and I have to agree. Like this film, even by the ending of it, we see that Henry and you know the Karen they just have a normal life. By the end of it, you know they're they like, assume different identities and they're just normal people. So regardless of what would happen, yeah, Karen probably would have just been better. But obviously, it's it's easy me saying this, you know, retrospectively, of course. But yeah, it just it would have been easier from Karen's life just to let let go of that of that gangster life. Yeah, is it just because he's a handsome man? He is a handsome man, isn't he? he? He he sort of reminds me of a bit like of a cross between like Joaquin Phoenix, but also like Pierce Brosnan a little bit. I I, I was gonna say for for me it's uh what Joaquin Phoenix and Leonardo DiCaprio. I think I think mm. that's sort of the, yeah, that's good, the that's mix good, that I see, that's a good which point. is surely appeal, appealing to uh to Karen. Absolutely. Uh, but you know we we sort of see that he constantly betrays their marriage. Uh, you know, in infidelity and uh, in, in in other manners. And with a wife who knows all of your secrets that could easily put you in prison, you would think you would do everything to treat her as best as possible so oh, she doesn't betray yeah. you. Yeah. But he has, he has two different mistresses at one point. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, it just seems like he it seems like he's trying to piss her off into the point of betraying him. Yeah. It gets to a point where sure doesn't um the gangster, like the big gangster like Paul, he's like, Yeah, I think it's time you better just stay with Karen now. This is getting a bit out of hand. And then and then Henry just has to go like, Yeah, fair enough. Like I've probably went a bit too far. But yeah, like it's crazy. Like you because you know, Karen could just so it's, it's a sort of similar thing with um um and I, I will not get too deep into this, but um, you know the wife of like Jeffrey Epstein, like she's still alive, and you you sort of think like she she could leak a lot of information about him and like all his acts and stuff. But I I don't know much about it. It's a sort of a similar situation. I think her name's like something Maxwell. I don't know, but uh, she, it's a sort of similar dynamic there. Would you agree? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, you know, sort of p- pissing someone off to the point that they will, you know, ha- have have no like moral issues with just exposing all of yeah. your secrets. Yeah, yeah, you know, I I have no idea why you would do all of that so publicly in front of them and then uh just risk everything by treating them badly you know uh, uh, either uh, either don't involve them or treat them well you know uh so yeah it sort of defied all logic and in that vein these people are so bad at being mobsters you know uh af- after they pull this big heist uh you know sort of jimmy gets very paranoid and he kills off all of the conspirators but you know he he kills them in all these ritualistic ways like he hangs one of the the people from like meat hooks in like uh <laughs> yeah. in like a in an abattoir van uh and you, you should only really commit a ritualistic killing if you're trying to send a message if you're if you're trying to just dispose of people so that they don't expose your link to the crime then you know oh, quietly <laughs> bury them you know <laughs> yeah. like cuz we swear to say that you know one is put in like you know a, a, like a garbage truck to be crushed that's a good idea but if you're doing a ritualistic killing they'll look into that murder just murder them quietly hide the body oh yeah, then, <laughs> yeah no, for sure no, no body no murder no crime uh yeah. so that they're, they're so they bad make, at their yeah. jobs yeah and um something about you know we've talked about jurassic park before and how i didn't realize sam l jackson was in it this has happened to me again yeah. where i didn't realize sam l jackson was in this and his death is absolutely hilarious <laughs> yeah <laughs> is he just Korean blue now? yeah he, he's just like Oh yeah, I was having sex last night, but she she's gone away and then <laughs> yeah. get, gets his head blown out. <laughs> exactly. Did you know he was in this? I know. I, I I didn't know that he was in the film in, until I saw him, obviously. Uh, but you know, the the first glimpse, I was like, is that is that Samuel L. Jackson? Yeah. And yeah. I was like, oh no, it can't be. Uh, and then, know, and then it, the same it transpired was the same. that it was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't have very much uh, else to say because I think I think beyond sort of the 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 dynamics between the characters. Uh, especially, you know, Henry's treatment of his wife. You know, I, I don't think, that, like, none of the films that we're going to talk about today are hugely eventful, you know, which is why our notes are relatively sparse. But did you have anything else uh, to say about the film? Nothing else for me either, Calm. Uh, if, if, if we don't have anything else to say, I'd love to hear your reading for this one. Yeah, you know, I, I've gone your right of uh, taking notes on a device and then sort of doing a, a, a pithy, uh, you know, description of my, my score and then I, I wrote the score down. So, uh, th- this film is somehow both fun and funny whilst being tense and violent, uh, which, you know, re- really uh, me- meant that, you know, I had vast enjoyment in the film, 10 out of 10. Man, that was fantastic. I'd have to agree, Broly. You know, I think this is a masterpiece in many ways. And, you know, I, I-, I sort of, I'm-, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of these sort of gangster movies, I think. So I think I might watch Scarface pretty soon. Hopefully, hopefully get that watched. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of this one. I think, you know, um, I think Joe Pesci is fantastic. De Niro is fantastic. And obviously, um, who's the guy that plays Henry again? <laughs> I forget his name. Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta. Fantastic as well. And, you know, it, this film has such a great, like, array of side characters as well. You know, the guy who plays Polly and the actress who's Karen is fantastic. And, you know, it, it gives such great backstory to Henry Hill. And it's such an interesting world of, of, um, of gangsters and stuff. It's such an interesting world back then. So I'd have to give it a 10 out of 10. I, I thought it was fantastic, man. Absolutely. Uh, Matthew, you know, the, the film is based on uh, the book uh, that, that was written, uh, that was, was, was written, you know, years prior. And then mm. the writer of the novel uh, co-wrote the screenplay. But okay. the, the, the name of the novel is actually Wise Guys. And I just yeah, want to yeah. know, do, wh- wh- which title do you prefer? I like Wise Guys. Goodfellas is good, but it just reminds me, good, uh, no pun intended there. But Wise Guys sounds, that's, that's, that's a good title. What about you, mate? Yeah, because I mean, you know, they really awkwardly shoehorn in a line where they're like, yeah, good you know, fellas. good fellas, yeah. like fellas that are good, you know, yeah. guys that you want to hang out with, like good fellas, <laughs> good fellas. You know, and I'm you like, know, good I, I feel, I feel like wise guys is just so much more self-explanatory, and you don't need the sort of like expository dialogue. I have to assume that they just couldn't, for legal reasons, use the title of the novel. 
Uh, but you know, I, I think that that is a, a far better title. Absolutely. Well, the script is fantastic, apart from that little exposition where it's like, you know, around these part of town, we have fellas. We call them good. The good fellas. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Yeah. So, uh, but no, apart from that, fantastic. Um, I suppose we should move on to our next film now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it The Fugitive, 93? It, it is The Fugitive, yeah. Um, no. So, I'll just have yes. to go back your notes in this one, bro. Okay, so I, I don't have a huge amount to say because mo most of my points are just about the ineptitude of the police in this film. Oh, uh, okay, and you know, obviously throughout the film, you know, we're, we're obviously going in with a biased perspective because very early on we know for a fact that Kimball is innocent. You know, I thought they were maybe going to leave it a bit, I'm, 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 fuck my life, a little bit ambiguous. Yeah. Uh, but you know, quite early on we see the flashbacks to the murder. Obviously, they could have said, oh, he's insane and he's remembering things that didn't happen. He actually killed her. But, you know, I, I had a feeling that they weren't going to go that route. So, you know, we knew we knew very early on that, we, that he was innocent. So sort of that sort of corrupts our perspective like of the police. We're like, oh, well, why can't you say he's innocent? But I, I honestly think there's pretty much no evidence to convict. So we, we can sort of talk about that now. But, like, I don't really understand how they think, like, Kimball's DNA being in his own home is evidence. And when they present it in court, it is the weakest argument I've ever heard. They say that there's no, there's no forced entry. They could have, like, she could have let someone in. Uh, they say there are no prints yeah. other than the housekeeper. Then why is she not on trial if that's part of your chief evidence? Yeah, you, know, you can't exactly. say, you can't say, exactly. oh, there's no DNA uh, other than, other than Kimball and the housekeeper. So we've arrested Kimball. I'm like, well, you've just said that there's an equally prime suspect that you're not exactly, investigating. Exactly. You know, like Tommy Lee Jones's character, like easily deconstructs the argument in in like one line because like the prosecutors go, oh yeah, we we basically put him away because you know we 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 assumed it was for like her life insurance policy so we could get money. But then Tommy Lee Jones's character is like, he's a doctor, mate. He already has fucking loads of money. Why would he do it? It's it's quite obvious. Like why? And they're would like more money. More money. Exactly. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like there's no way. He should, like the, the this. I think the film knows that because it hundred percent just skips any jury. And that scene, it just goes straight to the judge. You know, just the judge, just like, yep, you're going to lethal injection. See ya. Yeah, that's no, it. That's that was just, so ridiculous. Yeah. But no. Apart from that, um, I've got to say, this is actually one of my favorite films of the four today. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. It's a very Liam Neeson style film for me, and I love his films. And um. No, Harrison Ford, I would say this is definitely the best performance that I've seen Harrison Ford give, to be honest with you, you know. Oh, damn. Oh, that's a, that's a high Jones call. And Han Solo. I think this is, he's absolutely fantastic here. And he rocks the beard, mind you, as well. Oh, he, he absolutely rocks the beard. But really, you, like, because I've never taken him as Han Solo, and I thought that as Rick Deckard, he, he, would, he was sort of, you know, interchangeable, because obviously Ryan Gosling plays that character, or a very similar character archetype, even better in Blade Runner 2049. But I think where he really shines is where he's, because he, he's, he seems like a grumpy dude, uh, you know, in interviews and stuff. And I think that's partly just his persona because he knows that people, the people find that funny. So I, I, th I think that's part of his persona. I think he's actually a really charismatic guy. And my favorite, my favorite roles are always where he's like got a bit of a smile and he's having a good time, which <laughs> yeah, is mostly probably. Indiana Jones and the parts of this film where his wife is not dead. Uh, so sort of seeing him act like, jovial and happy and smiley like it's it's very refreshing to see and that, that those is, are always yeah. my favorite performances of his oh absolutely dude absolutely like you know this this film in many ways you know there there is there's a lot lot to say about it that's, that's good you know tommy lee jones this is i think this is the only film that i've seen him in aside from like men the blend and black films and then captain america and, and you know he, he's actually fantastic here to be honest with you like regardless of the the adapt attitudes of the police which we'll get into like the police are awful here he is pretty good like i, I like him and um you know one thing about this film apparently the the big like spectacle train crash scene apparently that was like the biggest stunt ever done until that time which i thought was really interesting yeah i mean it was it was just a very illogical series of events it's like oh yeah they they crash coincidentally and then they flip over onto a train track where then the train can't stop in time and then crashes into, <laughs> yeah, into the van exactly. like it is it is a mad sequence honestly yeah and uh you know, I was sort of waiting for the moment where I, I, th I thought maybe, uh, you know, the the sort of the, the police officer that was in the van that Kimball uh, saved, I thought that he was maybe going to be in a coma for a few days or a few weeks and then wake up and his testimony that Kimball saved him was going to be the thing that would exonerate him. Uh, but then they sort of immediately say that he doesn't remember the events. But I think that, I think that sort of saving him for like a last minute, like, 
oh, he saved me. He's a good guy. Would have would have helped like his yes, credibility as a yeah, character. Absolutely. And the film actually, a, a lot of the characters that are in that sort of opening sequence, you know, a lot of the fellow prisoners, we obviously see one of them again, who's like, who gets caught halfway through the film. And it's sort of like a bit of a subversion because you think the police have caught Kimball. But yeah, the, the, the prisoner who like is like foaming at the mouth, I thought that was going to be a bigger plot line wherein, you know, he was involved in like the killing or something or something like that. I thought it was good. But then it's just like a little like, oh no, like he was just a little nothing character that just helped Kimball escape, I suppose, isn't it? There was nothing really to it. Yeah, I, de I definitely thought that the character that they shot halfway through the film was going to turn out to be the murderer uh, and that he was just arrested for an unrelated crime, but that he committed the murder. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that, that, that sort of leads me on to the fact that I was kind of underwhelmed by the, uh, by the revelation of the, the motivation for the murder, that it was just like a drug conspiracy. Uh, you know, that, that sort of, uh, you know, yeah, it, well, it, 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 it didn't meet my expectations. Yeah, I actually had a, a something written down here where I would have preferred it if, like, I'm not, I'm not saying this idea is better, by the way, I'm just I'm, I'm positing an idea. Like, if it turns out that uh, Kimball had actually, like, fucked up a surgery for someone, and then, like, it's someone's relative who had died, and then someone who, who was, like, the relative wanted to kill Kimball for killing them during an operation or something, I don't know. That was an idea I'd written down. It probably doesn't make any sense, but I, I thought the drug avenue was a bit, a bit strange, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't like the drug avenue. I would have much preferred the, the idea that you just said. But even if you're going to go the drug way, uh, I also didn't like the fact that they made Charles like the principal villain. I would have preferred that they actually said that uh, Kimball's wife was a villain and that, you know, like Kim, Kimball sort of assumes later on that because of his research, they were after him. But then I would have liked if uh, his wife was actually a bad guy and she was killed intentionally because she was that would have been cool, uh, do, yeah. do, doing something to interfere with the company. You know, so I, I, I thought that sort of changing it up and saying that she she died because of uh, something bad she was doing, you know, I, I think that would have been interesting. Yeah. And Matthew, did you know that this, this film's actually based on a television series? I had read that, yeah, but I don't know much about it, man. Was I suppose it was called The Fugitive as well. Yeah, it's, it's exceptionally similar, but I'm baffled by the fact that it's, 120 episodes it's like how are you stretching this storyline for 120 episodes because the character that like tommy lee tommy lee jones plays here is maybe only in 34 episodes of the 120 it's like what tension are you bringing yeah yeah Mo most of the episodes must be just like kimball just about what about shops or something just like on the run <laughs> yeah I, th I think it's like I, I i don't know like i didn't read much into it because like there, there was a lot of information obviously it's a very long-running series mm -hmm. but i i assume that it's like some sort of weird like episodic uh thing where you know every, every week he goes and helps another person you know at the risk of being caught like you know the way we see in this film that you know he risks being caught by like helping the little boy and re-diagnosing him with a with a different condition uh you know i imagine that that happens like the most most of the episodes are him like going out of his way to help someone medically yeah. at the risk of getting himself caught mm -hmm. uh which would not be interesting to watch whatsoever no absolutely not and you know on the subject of that uh, sorry on the when you say about that scene um the, the one actress again i didn't realize was in this film was the lovable julianne moore who's always a delight like i love her and everything but she's in like 30 seconds and i was very disappointed i know like i i think it must have just been a, a thing of the 90s where this was obviously uh you know the introduction into film of like many actors and actresses that we regard as like very very you know that we highly regard today that have sort of like bit parts you know in like the usual suspects there's Jean Carlo Esposito from Breaking Bad uh, and there's also Clark Gregg from from the yeah, Marvel films I, yeah yeah you know so so I think I think that just in the in the 90s I guess this was their introduction to film so they have had sort of like small cameos and bit parts and then we're kind of like oh well we know them as, as a well as a well regarded actor or actress today, so we sort of have higher expectations for the role. Yeah, and you know, um, the the woman who gives Kimball a ride, you know, when he's like he's like walking in the highway, and then there's like a woman stops over. I thought that was Julianne Moore. That's not Julianne Moore, is it? No, like she she was brunette. I I have no idea who that actress was, yeah. but you know that that doesn't really come around that she sort of, you know, I expected her to you know maybe play a bigger role and maybe maybe be a a romantic lead. Like I th I thought they would maybe tease like the. Uh, you know, the, there would be a, a female supporting him throughout the film, uh, you know, because that, that sort of is a trope of this kind of film where uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're dealing with the death of a, of a loved one. You know, there's usually someone who, who steps up and, you know, sort of like helps you emotionally trans transition. Uh, and, you know, I thought, I thought either her or Julianne Moore would act yeah, as that, so, yeah. but, you know, we didn't, act, we didn't get to see much of that.
Mm-hmm. So obviously, Matthew, the crux of the film being called The Fugitive, is uh, that the Kimbo is on run from the police. If you were in his exact same shoes, would would you have run from the police? Pro, I'm a, I'd probably be very too way too scared to run from the police. To be to be honest with you, man, like Kim, Kimball does make a lot of risky risky plays. Like out of every vehicle in the hospital that he decides to steal, <laughs> decides to steal an ambulance. Yeah. I have no idea why, because, you know, he he then didn't say, you know, he, he didn't say, uh, you know, he was using it for a specific purpose. He didn't need it as like a battering ram. He literally just stole it because I guess the keys were in the ignition. But, you know, it, it was the 90s. I'm pretty sure he could have found a bunch of cars with the keys in the, in the ignition or like yeah. in the, you know, in the like sunglasses <laughs> the part. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, like in, like in Terminator. Terminator 2. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man, exactly. Like, to be fair, Tommy Lee Jones in this film, he has some cracking lines in here. Like, um, yeah, you know, I, I sort of talked about last week, you know, when I was saying, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, I had asked you whether you were sort of familiar with this film and you said no. And the, I, I told you about a very famous uh, line exchange, which I'm sure you're aware of now. I didn't kill my wife. I don't I don't care. care. <laughs> yeah. Like, I also quite like the line where it's like, don't let them give you any shit about your ponytail either. <laughs> I thought that was, that was good. Tell yeah, me that was a horrible ponytail. Uh, yes, Matthew. I, I quite like Tommy Lee Jones. You know, he's, I think he's quite underrated. Yeah, I think I think he's another person where people are like, "Oh, he's too grumpy to be likable." But you know, I I really enjoyed his presence in this film. Uh, have you heard the story about uh, Batman Forever with him and Jim Carrey? Have I told you this? No, tell me, tell me. Okay, so like the the night before filming a big scene for Batman Forever, <laughs> uh, Tommy Lee Jones was sat down at dinner. Uh, you know, just chillaxing, having a nice night, you know, probably with the wife, you know, getting a nice, sure. getting a nice juicy steak. He's state. loving life, yeah, you know, sure. Yeah, he's, he's loving life, you know, he's had probably a horrible time on Batman forever. Night before Big Scene, he's, you know, he, he's, he's down at the restaurant for, for, a wee, for a wee meal, and uh, Jim Carrey rolls in, uh, <laughs> and like, you know, he, he just says to Tommy Lee Jones, like, uh, oh, you know, n- nice to see you, can I, like, can I, share some dinner with you let's let's spend the night together let's have a let's have an awesome night before this big scene and tommy lee jones is just like he, he gets up like and you know jim carrey said that he, he stood up the blood drained from his face he hugged him in this sort of way like i want to kill you and then whispered i cannot sanction your buffoonery <laughs> such a tommy lee jones line as well I love yeah that. so he just does not tolerate any shit which i think gave him this sort of like grumpy persona uh that, that some people really take to uh yeah. you know sort of empathize with and i'm like i get i get you tommy lee jones i i can't sanction a lot of people's buffoonery yeah, yeah uh, you i know, love that line. like there are some people where i just i actually can't survive a conversation because i'm like i can't i can't deal with this <laughs> yeah like to be every film i've seen tommy lee jones in he's def he's always the same character 100 percent. like he's definitely one of the he's not the most versatile actor i would say i've seen but that being said he's one of those actors like he's very similar to liam neeson he's very good at one particular role if you get me so yeah he he's always like uh, the sort of like morally gray, uh, you know, po- like police officer or sheriff or, or like government official. You know, he's always he's always like the the morally questionable good guy. Like he he is still objectively yeah. the good guy, but he usually is, is going about it in sort of like a morally gray area. Yeah, uh, yeah. So he he doesn't have a huge a huge range. Uh, but you know, yeah, exactly. What what he does is is amazing. It's just that it's not a For huge sure, breadth. For sure, uh, no, but for sure. you know, we sort of talked about you know going on the run, and you know they they bring it up in the film that I I think there is pretty much no more surefire way to cement their guilty perspective of you, and Kimball sort of says you know oh, I don't care about appearances. You should. I think you should. Because <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, you know in exactly. in the end you know if if you're like pitching this guy as the killer you know which is the guy Frederick Sykes you know if you're saying this guy killed my wife they're absolutely not going to believe you like they're going to think you're like a raving lunatic. Yeah. Like, put it this way, I think there's, by Kimball going on the run, it, it gives even more evidence, if you can call it that, to him being guilty. Like, it doesn't help matters whatsoever. So, I, even though by the end, it's like, you know, his his innocence is probably, well, it's, it's guaranteed almost, you know, to be fair. But, like, to, that being said, you know, a lot of people still think Kimball is, like, has, like, murdered, has shot a cop by the end of the film. I'd imagine a lot of people, like, the only one who is, surefire knows that knows that he's innocent is tommy lee jones's character so i mean he's a lot of people yet to convince i would say 
Yeah. And I, I just have to say, like, we, we've talked about sort of the, the ineptitude of the police investigation, but how bad did it have to be that, like, one guy was able to solve it uh, and, yeah. like, a team of police couldn't? And they were just like, he's, he's the easy, he's the easy caller. We'll, we'll just get yeah. into that. Like, there, there's even one police uh, officer who says the phrase, he was convicted in a court of law, he's guilty. How ignorant do you have to be oh, to actually believe man. that every single person can, convicted of a crime is guilty? Sure, I know, I know. And one thing about, like, what, in, in to, like Nichols' plan, basically, so, out of everyone... Excuse me a moment, to... I feel like I hear thunder. I'll be back in one second. No worries, man. So, yeah, like, one thing about um, Nichols' plan was he decides to send the one guy who has a prosthetic arm to kill someone. I was just like probably not the best way to guarantee death in in a way you know like if that guy obviously that that arm i'd imagine would be quite quite strong but we see in the scene like it gets snapped so i mean it's probably not the best yeah. idea to guarantee like an execution of some kind or assassination yeah but also you know also you know sending an assassin with an incredibly identifying characteristic yes uh, you know uh, yes if, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. i didn't think of that yeah absolutely you know if, if he could limit that that arm down to like five possible suspects You've de you've definitely uh you know you've definitely you know gone gone wrong there. Absolutely. Uh, you know I, yeah. I I'd maybe wear gloves or something you know just to make sure that it isn't an identifying characteristic. Uh, but you know obviously his his ability you know he got he got the job done. He did. I guess he didn't get the job <laughs> like done because he, he was meant to kill. He was he was meant <laughs> to kill uh Harrison Ford. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what a guy, what a guy. Don't yeah, think. and uh, you know I wasn't shocked that Charles was the bad guy. But that revelation does call into question like his motivations for helping Kimball like financially and protecting him from the police. Like I have no I have no understanding of why he gave him that money and why he didn't turn him into the police. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if he had called the police yeah, and just point. said, Oh, this guy's a raving lunatic, like yeah, you have to protect me from him, you know, everything that he said, like uh, you know, you know, to to Charles's guilt would have just been uh disregarded. Yeah. No, that's so true, man. That's so true. It's sort of yeah, like by he, he should if by turning him into the police he would have saved the whole time of Kimball learning about his plan. Like just yeah, just turn him into the police, mate. Yeah, I mean obviously we're we're not saying that that would would have been a, a good thing uh, because obviously he should sure. be uh, yeah. you know f found out as the as the true murderer. Mm -hmm. Why why can I not say that word murderer? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, like <laughs> obviously yeah, obviously yeah. you know he committed the crime he should uh, do the time. Uh, but you know just. Lo logically, I I don't know why uh why he would be that involved uh yeah, but, you know no, help him, help him in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And my favorite scene in the film, Calum, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but it's it's when Kimball is fighting. Um, I think his name is Fence with the prosthetic arm on the train. Yeah. And uh, Kim Kimball, there's like a slow mo shot of of like Kimball trying to pull like a lever to like stop the train. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know what you're, well, like, I know, I know the scene, but I, I didn't, like, commit it to memory, like, I didn't think it was of, of any significance. <laughs> like, I've, I've seen that, I've, I've seen that scene somewhere before, and I can't tell, like, is it, is it that iconic? Like, I'll try and see if I can, um, find it on YouTube here, but I don't know, is it that, is it that of an iconic scene? It mustn't be. No, no, why would it be, Matthew? No, like, I've pulling, seen it like, before. the, the no. emergency stop? I've, I've I never think seen, I've seen that, that like on the Chris Duckman's like hilariosity intro or something, but it, this, Maybe, film, but this Matthew, film's too good to be. But Matthew, that. you do also objectively have the best scene wrong. Uh, you know, obviously the best scene is where he jumps down a dam, <laughs> <laughs> like his, his floppy body. <laughs> yeah, and you know he somehow survives. What I would have really appreciated was in the, if in the set design, like in his apartment, it said like champion diver or something exactly. because they say like exactly. they say it's a one in a million that he could have survived that that fall and he does and right after it's he, he not champion only survives diver. it but but he's like he's like you know he's like jogging he's right after yeah. you know even yeah. if he survived he would have like crushed every bone in his body unless he was a champion diver, but that's a champion I, I, diver. Need, exactly. I need evidence to that exactly it kind of reminded me have you seen like um the caravan of garbage for transformers 4 I, ha I haven't yet. No, but like there's a really funny bit in Transformers 4 where like Mark Wahlberg's character like knocks a guy out with an American football. But like it's, it's, it's sort of a similar thing to that. Like, you know, just have just have like a, a bit of exposition in the background. Like like a, a slow-mo shot of like a trophy of him like winning a diving competition like five years ago or something. That would have made, that would have made sense. 
yeah, and, and so it's like, oh, he just bafflingly survived this. Uh, so, Matthew, do you have any final remarks on the film, or would you like to go into ratings? I'd love to go into ratings, man. What, what would you give it out of, out of 10, dude? Well, you know, I, I think that the film is tense and interesting. You know, it creates a good mystery, but in the end, it has some anticlimactic revelations and motivations. So I would give it a 9 out of 10. That's great, man. I, I, I absolutely love this film. I think it's one of my favourites uh, of the four today. I think this is, the, as I said, the best Harrison Ford performance and fantastic um, counterpart in Tommy Lee Jones. So I'd have to give it a 10 out of 10, man. I loved it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I loved oh, it. Damn. It was great. Um, I suppose, what's the next? Is the next film Usual Suspects? It is The Usual Suspects. Awesome. And Matthew, awesome. this is the film for today that I would describe as tolerable. <laughs> Really? Okay. Okay. Fair. Fair. This is the first Brian Singer film we've reviewed since the X Men days, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't think we've talked about anything else. I'm sure soon we will be talking about Superman Returns and yeah. Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, but yes, this is this is the, the the latest one that we've discussed, and it's weird to think that he's actually been this successful because this film is probably his his highest regarded film. But I don't think anyone talks about it being a Brian a Brian Singer film. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've I've never I've never heard that. Uh, you know, so I I, I was kind of unsure of who directed this film until recently, because mm-hmm. I'd sort of heard a story about uh, the lineup scene where they were all lining up. It was meant to be played incredibly seriously, and then the line de- the, the line delivery of especially Stephen Baldwin and uh, Benicio del Toro just made everyone like piss themselves laughing. Apparently, Brian Singer was like furious and he like stormed off the set. <laughs> uh, Such a and Brian then he Singer just because. Yeah, and just because he couldn't get them to actually do the scene as he intended, he just committed to that scene being uh, o- overtly comedic. Yeah. Yeah, to be fair, I I, uh, I really absolutely love this film again. You know, you'd mentioned to me off part about there being a twist in this film, and apparently, like, you know, you, you'd said, obviously, like, it's, you know, everyone knows it, but I, I actually hadn't heard of it, so I was going on this film completely fresh, and I'm so glad I did. Yeah, I didn't want to say it on the podcast in case someone, like, posted in the comments, like, uh, you know, bloody, bloody Kent is Kaiser Soze. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, Matthew, like, I don't know how you have lived 18 years and did not hear about this. You know, I've known about it's this so for good. probably 10 years. It's so good, man. I love it. It's amazing. Is it? Oh, man. That's the real question. Is I it? it? I love it. Or is it kind of bad? Uh, it, you know? It's, it's, yeah. No, it, it's very similar to the, like, the, the, the classic cliche of, like, then I woke up kind of thing, like nothing really happened. Yeah, you know, I, I, th- I think because all of the events are obviously recontextualized by the revelation that at least a significant percentage of, of the testimony that is the narrative of the film is, is a lie because mm-hmm. we're all, we obviously find out that all the details that he's been picking, at least names, like he may, the, the entire story may have been the truth aside from the fact that he is actually Kaiser Soze, aside, you know, and the names like he may have just plucked the names from like the the board uh so the story may for the most part actually be accurate just with lies for the names uh but, you know that sort of calls into question everything that happens in the film so i think we pretty much need to start at the end because then that recontextualizes everything sure. that happens in the film so if you want to start with the twist uh it is obviously that uh verbal kent is kaiser soze or at least the film wants us to believe he is you know there are obviously theories that uh, he still isn't the real Kaiser Soze. Yeah, I've heard uh, a few people say that, that he's, um, a, he's a subordinate. Was, yeah, yeah, you know that that was sort of my interpretation. That you know, uh, obviously ver- verbal kent, like verbal uh, mean like Soze in Turkish. Yeah, it means, translates uh, to verbal. Yeah. Verbal. That's so, so you know that yeah. that is meant to be the overt uh, hint. But then you know why why would he choose an alias that translated to that unless you know he was trying to throw them off and that he isn't actually Kaiser Soze? Yeah. But I I think we just should approach this with the assumption that he is because yeah. that's what the film presents, uh, and that that makes this whole d- description a lot less confusing. Ma- a lot less confusing. The 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 actual like sort of twist that actually sort of hit me was sort of the fact that, yeah, okay, the crimes, so maybe they did happen, maybe they didn't, but it was the fact that he was faking having cerebral palsy. Like, he was just, like, he just, like, we see him sort of limping, and it's just, it's such a beautiful shot, and just as, like, that, this is going to sound weird, like, a beautiful shot on his feet. I don't mean it isn't his feet are beautiful, I just mean, like, it's a, it's no, a no, clever I, shot. I know exactly what you're talking about, very yeah. clever shot. And then, like, we see him, like, sort of limp, and then he, he just goes in, like, a very demanding stride, and then we see, like, he just, like, fixes his hand, and then just, like, lets it light a cigarette. Like, it's so well done. Like, it's it's sort of it's annoying how good of an actor Kevin Spacey is. Like I think he's one of the best of all time, which is obviously like you know, it's it's it is sad and sort of annoying. But 
Like, he, like uh, that was so good, man. I absolutely love that. What about you? Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I would definitely say I have some problems with the film, but the isolated scene of the revelation that he is Kaiser Soze and the moment, as you said, where his walk straightens and then he lights the cigarette is in itself a perfect scene. Like, there, there's not one one single problem with that scene. And then it ending on the line, uh, you know, the, the, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled uh, was convinced in the world that he doesn't exist. Like, that is the perfect way to end the film. And I, th- I think that does cement that the film wants you to believe that he is Kaiser Jose. So we, we will approach it, I think, with the, sure. with the notion that he is Kaiser Jose and not call that into a huge amount of question. Sure, sure, man. And it kind of made me think, you know, this, is, this film is brought to us by the same guy who did, like, X-Men Apocalypse, which is, by all accounts, like, a good X-Men film. But these are, this is, like, light, sort of, like, night and day, to be honest with you. Just, it doesn't feel like a same sort of film at all. I think that's honestly the, just in my perspective, I, I really don't think that film is like the director's medium. Uh, you know, I consider it like mm, a writer's good medium, point. Such a good uh, point. you know, where, cause, cause a lot of, a lot of directors are sort of interchangeable. You know, obviously there, there are a few with a unique style uh, and Mar- Martin Scorsese obviously always does the, pretty much always does the same genre. Uh, you know, he's always like doing films about scumbags basically. Uh, and you know, a, a lot of, a lot of directors associate with one genre and they have their unique style, but, Brian Singer seems like just a like an everyman director. Like yeah, there's nothing does. original or unique or interesting about his style. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I would say the the genius of this film is in the dialogue and the editing and the performances, all of which he is completely uh, irrelevant towards. Yeah, that's so true. Hell, that's so true for sure, man. So obviously, you you didn't know the twist for the film, but obviously, I came into the film with the biased perspective of knowing the twist, and from from knowing that. I, I still thought that the hints to his identity were heavy-handed uh, because, you know, ov- obviously the narrator of a film is never going to be inconsequential. You know, nev- never have I seen a film where, you know, the fifth most important character is the narrator. You know, that, that just never happens. You know, the narrator is always a character of note. So to have that character narrating the film, I was like, well, he's obviously going to be a big player. And then the film sort of plays down his position and then reveals him as the big crime boss. So I w- had I been watching the film not knowing that he was Kaiser Soze, I would have said, I don't know if I would have said that he was Kaiser Soze, but I would have said he's definitely a much bigger player than the film wants to present. Sure. No, that's a, that's a, great, that's a great point, man. That's a great point. And yeah, the film, I would definitely see why some people would sort of find it convoluted, uh, it, it, to be honest. But nonetheless, I thought the twist was f- fantastic. But for sure, like, I, th- I think the film sort of understates um, Burble's role in it. You know, I think you could definitely sort of tell, yeah, he, he has a bigger role to play here. Yeah, and I, I always knew the fact that he was Soze, but I never actually knew that uh, the narrative that he was telling was untrue. Uh, you know, I, I really thought that the only thing he was lying about was his identity and his proximity to the, to the boat. So, you know, I thought, I thought his only lie was really about uh, the exchange, you know, at the docks. You know, I didn't actually think he'd be lying about Redfoot or potentially about the heists or his relationships with, with the other criminals. Uh, you know, that could all be a lie and we'll never know. And that's sort of my biggest issue with the film. Uh, and it's, it's a very personal issue because I, I've never been a fan of ambiguity. And this film obviously leaves too many questions unanswered for my preference. Sure. Uh, as, many, as many would say that that like, adds to the beauty and the mystery of the film. It just lessened my enjoyment. I respect that, Callum, completely, dude. And you know, one thing about the film, if, if the police had done like a background check on Verbal, surely wouldn't they find out that he doesn't have cerebral palsy so they'd know he'd probably be a liar then? Yeah, you know, obviously if he was able to be taken in and fingerprinted, then they know his, they know his you know, birth identity. You know, they, they know, you know so I, I guess obviously he presumably wasn't born Kaiser Jose. You know, that's obviously an alias. He sure. wasn't born Verbal Kent because that's a, a assumed identity. But you would think that now when they have his prints on file and they know his face, they know he is Kaiser Soze, he, his, his identity is surely completely burnt. You know, he will 100% if he's cited, he will be arrested. And that's sort of where, you know, a lot of my points are kind of confused because obviously for, you know, 90% of the film, I was thinking that the, the events for the most part were happening. Yeah. So a lot of my points are related to things that may or may not have actually happened. Uh, but, you know, sort of him... Uh, you know, if, if, we, if we take it at face value that he was pretending to be Kent in his interactions with the criminals throughout the entire film uh, until, the, until the dockyard where he obviously killed them all, uh, 
then you know i sort of find this as like you know the verbal character as like the biggest uh case of hubris in crime i've ever seen you know if he takes yeah. part in the crimes that he's secretly orchestrated just to prove what a criminal a criminal mastermind he is uh when he's just putting himself in a position to be identified during those crimes or arrested for unrelated crimes because sure. obviously he, he he's arrested at the end you know for a for a gun possession charge which he may or may not have wanted to have been arrested for i think he he wanted to be arrested so he could give the fake testimony and confuse them and then and then leave but then when he leaves they know what his face is they know he's kaiser soze so they will come after him with everything they have so i don't think there's any case where he walks away and doesn't get caught so it's, it's, it's actually such a good point man and you know i, I actually cons- considered that to be honest because yeah you know he, they know his face and stuff now and obviously like we, we see with the witness identification of his face you know it looks exactly like kaiser soze is in many ways you know what i mean so it, it, so if, if they put two and two together, yeah, Kevin Spacey's face with Kaiser Suze's face, yeah, it's the same guy. Yeah, it, like there, there's so many levels to this film and obviously it could be, like people could say, oh, it was all part of Kent's plan, you know, or whatever his real name is. You know, it was, it was all part of the plan and, you know, he went in to give the fake testimony just to confuse them. But if he's just going in to confuse them, why is he exposing his face? Why not let an underling do it? And then I suppose that's where the argument of he is an underling to the real Kaiser Soze. That's what I'm saying. He's, yeah. he's just acting as a decoy. But then, you know, I, I feel like. If it was Kaiser Soze, though. I'd prefer if he was. I, I prefer that he's Kaiser Soze because then I think, you know, removing that from that character removes all substance from him. You know, it just means that he was a. Yeah like a spy for Kaiser Soze, he's just an underling, you know, which makes the character infinitely less interesting. You know, I yeah, think- Yeah, I agree, Callum, yeah. I, th- I think I the mystery builds and builds and builds to that revelation. And if that revelation is false, I think the film is no longer interesting. Yeah, no, I'm completely the same boat with you, man, to be honest with you. And one, one thing about this movie, um, well, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I had sort of said, you know, by the group, by the usual suspects, we'll call them the five, by taking down the corrupt police drug taxi service, could you argue that that is an act of vigilantism, even though they technically are stealing from these corrupt police officers? Like the corrupt police officers are doing are smuggling drugs throughout the country, so technically by by getting fifty of them arrested, that's pretty good work. Yeah, they're definitely. I, I think the the police officers are definitely doing the bigger crime because obviously they're also spitting in the face of the of the laws that they you know that they uh, vowed to uphold. Sure. So they're they're actually committing a worse crime. So yeah, this is sort of uh, you know a lesser of uh two evil situation yeah, where you know yeah. they are objectively committing a crime but yeah i think in that instance their actions were morally justified and they were probably doing a service uh, yeah. to the community <laughs> but yeah obviously that that doesn't Weird justify it and they do further in the film because yeah. obviously for for a lot of uh, for a lot of the film i was sort of like with some of them you know oh, as, yeah. especially uh dean keaton but Same. obviously we can't even know if that if any of that actually happened maybe kent was just lying to portray a you know a good perspective of him so like such a good perspective of him that the police questioned that and then went oh he must be kaiser soze uh you know mm-hmm. uh the, there's so many layers to this film and you know it just all leads to a very confusing mess in my brain that's fair uh, you that's know yeah, you know that. if we assume that if we assume that you know the crimes that they did actually did take place and that there was a character who fenced like their stolen goods but his name wasn't redfoot if we just call that character Redford, assume some of that happened at least. Sure. He says that he doesn't have good, like guys as good as the usual suspects, but honestly, they all seem incredibly amateurish. You know, they make terrible plans. They don't wear gloves, and he was probably just lying in order to be able to like put the crime on them if they fucked up. But I really can't believe that these like career criminals aren't self-aware enough to know that they're shit at it. Oh yeah, I know, I know. Like it's it's a, it's a thing I sort of want to get into and hate as well because we sort of like you talked about Kaiser. Well, well, we'll call him Kaiser Suit. We'll call him Verbal, but slash Kaiser Suit. You know, Verbal puts himself in the usual suspects. Like he is the crime boss, but like you said, Calum, like he's in the crime. He's sort of in the he's in the five, but as a secret big boss. And that's sort of a similar thing. That's um, oh, what's the character's name? Robert De Niro's character in. In, um, in his, name's Sh- his name's Neil. Neil. I don't remember his surname. Neil McCauley, I think it is. Neil McCauley. And like Neil is sort of like the big mastermind of his criminal org- organization, but he sort of puts himself in the crime. So he's like actively a crime member, but also he's the crime boss. So it's, it was, it's sort of a weird, it's a weird one. But um, you know, in, in this, in this film, I don't know if you noticed this. You probably did. But 
there's like a shot of like a really cool shaped uh, this is sort of an architecture point but there's like a weird building but it's, it's actually the same building as the daily bugle in Remy spider-man i did not notice that i was not paying enough attention to this film because i was like there, there was there were points where i was so lost because of the non-linear narrative uh mm. you know I, I I really don't think I'm going to enjoy Quentin Tarantino's films when I get around to watching them because, you know, I've heard, like, Pulp, pulp Fiction and, uh, you know, Kill Bill and, you know, all, all of those films often follow an, uh, a non-linear narrative. And I would say the only time I've really been able to tolerate that, uh, you know, the, the two times I would say were Deadpool because I think that was very clear what was in the past, what was in the present because it all sort of led up to the events mm. of, like, The Bridge in Deadpool and yeah. 500 Days of Summer because it sort of had a title card constantly saying like what day it was, you know, I think that was helpful. But in this film, you know, I was, I was sort of lost moment to moment as to whether yeah. it was present totally. day or future or past. Yeah, no, I'd agree with you, man. I agree with you. And we've talked about uh, actors who we were surprised and who were in the film as your sort of big names now. And Clark Gregg, you had mentioned was in this and uh, just a wee cameo was a wee surgeon, but I thought, I thought it was nice. He's always a delight on screen, isn't he? Yeah, you know, I, I'm always shocked to see him in, in films because, you know, I sort of think him think of him now, uh, I sort of associate him with TV because of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and that's sort of been his, his longest commitment. You know, he's, he was in, I think, just three Marvel films, was it? Uh, he was Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Thor, uh, the, Avengers. the Avengers and Thor. So yeah, he, was in, he, was in, four. Four, he was in four and then died and then he came back, to, back in Captain Marvel. Uh, but, you know, that character I sort of associate with TV and therefore Clark Gregg. So to see him sort of pop up in these very popular films, uh, yeah, it always takes me aback. Yeah, he's got, he's got such a nice calming voice, doesn't he? I, I quite like his voice. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Uh, Matthew, <laughs> uh, you know, we sort of talked about the fact that because of his testimony at the end being pretty much tarnished by the fact that he was taking details from the bulletin board, uh, you know, we really have no idea what was true, what was a lie. Sure. And do you like that about the film? Uh, you know, you love it. It's sort of like a Joker situation where, yeah, I think we sort of had very similar opinions wherein, like, with the whole reveal that a lot of, you know, Arthur Flex action, like, actions and stuff in that film didn't actually happen. And I can definitely respect why people like yourself would sort of criticize it and, like, lessen your likability for it because it's sort of, you don't like ambiguity and stuff, and for sure. But for me, I, I thought it was really, really well done in this film for me personally. But I can definitely understand why you would dislike it. Yeah, it was definitely better done in this film than Joker. Oh, yeah. In the moment where in Joker where they're like, oh, was it was it all his fantasy? I'm like, well, I fucking hope not, because then me watching the entire film is pointless, uh, you know, because it was yeah. all in his head. At least in this film, if it's all a lie, it wasn't in his head. It's like a delicately crafted story by a genius. You know, that's at yeah. least better than he sort of just dreamed it up. You know, it's a it's an intricate it's an intricate falsehood. Uh, yeah. And, you know, in that sense, I can sort of respect it a intricate lot more. I like that, yeah. So, I see, man. If we go back to review Joker one day, like oh, we more, will. Because yeah. well, because I mean, one, my my opinions have definitely changed, and two, I haven't actually heard the review, but you say it sounds like ass. I think both of our opinions have probably changed, to be honest with you, buddy. Because I think you'll probably like it more, and I'll probably like it less. Because the more and more I think about it, the more and more I think it's just a blatant King of Comedy ripoff, but it's just not as good as King of Comedy. Yeah, that that will that will infinitely piss me off when I watch it because I will be like, this is just. I mean, I suppose it's you could argue. Yeah, you know, obviously, you know, the, there's, there, there are film archetypes, like, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the biggest film archetype is that there's this idea of, like, you know, the, the hero and the princess and, sure. uh, you know, the lovable sidekick, you know, there are obviously sure. those, those very uh, overt, very broad, very vague character archetypes. And, you know, sort of Star Wars was the, was the first, uh, was the first story to really tell that sort of, like, you know, knight's tale where there's like mm. this knight in shining armor and the princess, you know, it was sort of that with like a sci-fi skin on it. Whereas sure. uh, point, Joker yeah. is sort of like the king of comedy and similar films with a, with a comic book film skin on it. But you know, wh when you're not stealing like that, that's not stealing a story archetype that's stealing a film's plot. So I, I really yeah. think I will resent Joker when I watch it again Yeah, for that. Uh, I still, I, I still enjoy it, but it's just like, it's one I just prefer King of Comedy, and two, it just steals way, way too much, in my opinion. Yeah, the King Comedy is so much better. Uh, you know, because you know, you, you're actually able to empathize with all of the characters. Uh, I mean, well, what what did we really say about the King Comedy? Like, did we did we empathize sure. with uh, Rupert Pumpkin? I think I think we did. I think we sort of felt that like we definitely talked a lot about like 
how the ending of the film and how whether it was realistic or not what you know when he becomes like a big celebrity and stuff but i think i i, I don't know I, cause that was when was that that was obsession so that was a while that was a good 20 20 or so yeah, that was like ago. episode 28 i think yeah that was a, that was probably one of my favorite recordings actually episode 28 obsessions yeah. i love check, that. check out the playlist of uh must see movie mates yeah ab- yes absolutely ab- absolutely check that out and um this this episode will probably go into the classic cinema as well with uh, obsession as well hopefully wonderful so matthew did you have any final points on the film nothing for, more for me brother i'd love to hear your rating if you don't have anything else so i think that the film has obviously exceptional performances and dialogue but for me an immensely confusing narrative and you know as i said i'm never a fan of ambiguity they left too many questions unanswered for my for my personal enjoyment you know obviously i can see the the intricacies and the respect that people would have for that Uh, and you know i just never enjoy a narrative where it it was all a lie or it was all a dream Uh, but you know i do think that this does it a lot better than most films uh, that try to replicate that kind of success uh, so I'd give it an 8 out of 10 because I can definitely respect all of the, the performances and dialogue. Uh, and the, di- the direction of the film is, I mean, it's unoriginal, but it's obviously competent. Uh, you know, Brian Singer, I'm not going to give him a huge amount of credit, uh, you know, but, you know, it, w- it was obviously a competent enough job. But my one question I forgot to ask you, Matthew, is uh, do you think that Benicio Del Toro dethrones Marlon Brando for least understandable American accent? Oh, he's close. He definitely rivals him. It's, it's a funny one, to be honest with you, man. It's a funny one. Ooh, Marlon Brando still got it for me, but Benicio Del Toro is up there, man. What about yourself? Yeah, I, I think that because this is clearly a character choice and every character is like, what the fuck are you saying? You know, yeah. that that's obviously a character choice, whereas I think Marlon Brando is just an idiot. And like he was like, <laughs> yeah. he was like let me try this. Let me try this Southern accent. And then it's just like incomprehensible you know yeah exactly man exactly but for me um buddy i think this film is quite convoluted as you said but nonetheless what a fantastic twist in my opinion i'm very glad that um i didn't know about it i love this movie to bits and as much as i you know you know as as much as it annoys me how good kevin spacey is he's probably i would definitely rate him in the top in my top two not favorite i'm definitely not favorite but best actors of all time so for me, yeah. Is Joseph Gordon-Levitt the other one? Joseph gordon I, I think, the, I'm trying to think best actors of all time. I'd say Joaquin Phoenix and probably Kevin Spacey of the two. They're definitely interchangeable at one and two. Do you have any? What, I, who actually, I, feel, I fully agree with that, Matthew. Really? 100%. Ke- oh, that's Joaquin great. Phoenix gives the, the best performances I've ever seen. You know, I, I really did not like Joker when I saw it. Uh, and I think that that is partly because they ripped off the King of Comedy you know, which I wasn't fully aware of. Obviously, I hadn't seen the film, but I was I was aware of. I, I you know, people had said that it was an homage, whereas mm. you know, it's it's just a it's just a remake, yeah, uh, with sure. a different skin. Sure. And you know, with, with with them saying it's an homage, you know, I think it's I think it's ridiculous. If if I were Robert De Niro, I wouldn't have involved myself. I would have said, "Now nah, you're you know stealing uh, the original work of Martin Scorsese." You know, I think it. I I think it was a it was an embarrassing uh, att- attempt yeah, at making no, a agree. new thing. I agree. And stealing like stealing the original intellectual property, uh, but you know I I cannot question the fact that Lacking Phoenix deserve deserve that best actor Oscar. Oh man, tell me about it. Yeah, so like if I was gonna rate top two, I'd say I'd actually put Kevin Spacey above Lacking Phoenix for me slightly, just but yeah, Spacey. I mean, based on this and American Beauty, I think I think that's perfectly fair. So yeah, I'd have to give this a ten out of ten, absolute masterpiece of that. Okay. No, me honestly like. This is right up there with uh, with um, unconventional romances in, in terms of uh, ratings for me. They're all they're all up there. To be honest, I'll not give away my rating for Heat, so I'll not. But it's it's it's, it's up there, man. It's it's up there. Um, I'm Matthew. Just waiting for the wee the wee recording uh, symbol to come up. But yes, Matthew. I think the final question I need to ask you in regards to the usual suspects is where do you think that the twist ranks among uh, the most famous of the of film oh see i'm trying to think of twists that i quite like and what's your favorite cinematic like twist is probably the best. well i mean matthew please tell me you haven't lived under a rock so long you don't know the ending to the sixth sense i don't know the end of the sixth sense matthew what is wrong with you see i like, know I, <laughs> see have you only, never been on I the internet i might know about it is because in the lonely island song there's like whatever, yeah Bruce exactly. is dead in the end of sixth sense <laughs> yeah like, yeah uh yeah so you know and to be fair you know i knew that going into the sixth sense and uh it did it in no way shape or form lessened my 
enjoyment of the film. You know, I think it actually enhanced my viewing because I was able to I was able to pick out the clues, whereas I think that ruined watching The Usual Suspects. Right. Uh, you know, I think I think it actually enhanced my viewing of uh, The Sixth Sense, but I would 100% rank that as the number one best cinematic twist of all time. Okay. Because okay. honestly, honestly, if you don't know, it comes out of absolutely nowhere, and it's amazing. And then when you go back, you, you see every little clue, and it's, it's actually amazing. I but then sort of comparing it to famous twists that I don't like, like Planet of the Apes, and I, I guess I like The Usual Suspects. I just don't think it's as incredible or spectacular as people you know make it out to be but i would say the planet of the apes is objectively like a bad twist like i could not care less that it's earth because yeah. that was abundantly no, no, I obvious agree. i agree i suppose like back like i'd imagine like for movie goers who watched um sp- uh split in the cinema when they realized that like shit that's bruce willis from unbreakable there like that must have been pretty big oh yeah for me yeah i started freaking out because unbreakable is uh my favorite m night Shyamalan film Mm, I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe the sixth sense. Uh. But. But. I. Uh, yeah. I absolutely freaked out when I saw Bruce Willis because I had no idea that was going to happen. And obviously, yeah. that. That. I mean, that's barely a twist because, you know, the. You know, there was literally no. There. You know, there was no reason why that should be a sequel to Unbreakable. And they were just like, "Fuck it." There's Bruce Willis. You know, there was no. Mm-hmm. There was no connection yeah. really. They were just like, "Here's a character in a film. Here's a character in a film. They're the same universe. Who cares?" You know. So there. There weren't really enough connections. You know to sort of justify it but uh, but i yeah i freaked out in cinema when i saw that i'm trying to think of my favorite cinematic twist of all time um i think this could be a wee, a wee you know separate separate video of separate uh, video, uh, like yeah. the top 10 twists and we sort of were, were like you know as rated by the yeah. internet and then we say whether we hate them yeah that's a good idea that's good. i'll have to ponder that one off off the podcast i think to be honest with you that's a good one but um i suppose now we can move on to our fourth and final film of the day heat yes and i would say i have the least to say about this film out of all of the films that we're going to be discussing today. Same, same, man. Um, because, you know, yeah. whilst it being two hours, 50 minutes long, uh, I have qu- quite a small amount to say. No, I'm the same, man, I'm the same. My opening note here is, damn, De Niro sits a goatee. And, uh, he's, I think he's too Danny thing. He's, he's such a, he's, he's, he's a handsome he, you man. know, he's just such a presence. He is. Uh, he really but, you know, is. one thing that disappointed me in this film was I knew the go- I knew going in it was about the rivalry between uh, between Robert De Niro and uh, Al Pacino's characters, but I was actually hoping for once that De Niro played the good guy because you know I've I've seen quite a few De Niro films and every single time he is like the scumbag. Aside from I've seen him in one film where he didn't play a scumbag and that was called The Intern, where he played Anne Hathaway's uh, like you know subordinate, and it's actually a, it's actually a really like heartwarming film uh, and he's he's a really nice guy in it. But, you know, aside from that, I've never seen him not play a scumbag. How about you? Just Joker. But then I, we don't really see him in Joker, so he's not really a are you Are you kidding, character. Matthew? Because, I mean, he's not the worst guy in Joker, but he is a bad guy. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, like, by, scum, my de- like, for, by scumbag, like, I suppose, like, in, in this one, like, in these sort of films, like, Hate and Goodfellas, it kind of gets me sort of in a confused situation. Who does the movie want me to root for? And who do I actually root for? So, for example, in this film, I actually really like both De Niro and Al Pacino's characters, so I couldn't. I was rooting for both of them, but I think the film wants us to root for. Um, I think the film wants us to root for Al Pacino's character more than De Niro's character. To be honest, what, where 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 we land on that one? Well, weirdly, obviously, yeah, Robert De Niro is the one that obviously commits the crimes, commits murders. Uh, I don't. I don't know whether he actually murders any innocent people in the film. He's obviously he obviously like shoots a lot of like cover gunfire. You know, especially in the in the sort of highway sequence after they after they robbed the bank of the the twelve point two million dollars, sure. So he probably did wind up, you know, shooting a police officer and killing or injuring innocent people. So obviously, to to that degree, uh, you know, I I don't I don't sympathize with the character, but he is the character that by the end I'm like, oh, I hope he get he gets away, uh, more at least more than any of his co-conspirators. Me but too. obviously, <clears throat> it in the film, you know, you're obviously yeah ro- rooting for the good guy, which is not Robert De Niro. But I think. I think you sort of get the feeling that he could change. Like, when he retires, oh, that yeah. he's just an objectively good guy. Like, yeah. you know, we, we don't really know any anything of his backstory, but I think if they had sort of uh, explored, you know, why he chose to be a criminal, I, I think that maybe would have added more depth and said, you mm-hmm. know, if, if they said he, he needed the finances, you know, for something, or it was because of his background, you know, I think that would have added at least one more layer to sort of near, like, obviously not justify his actions for killing innocent people. 
mm-hmm. you know, maybe add context. Yeah, my favorite scene in the film is actually is when you know him and Edie first meet, and like I I just love the desperation in his voice when he when he asks her to go to New Zealand with him. I think he's a really vulnerable character there. And um, I, th- I think him and Edie, like Neil and Edie's relationship was so, so well done because, like I said, she sort of brings out her vulnerability to him as well. And you know, at the end, you know, as we see they're driving to the airport, so you want her, sorry, you want him and Edie to go to New Zealand, but then his own greed gets the better of him. Like, it, by the end of the film, like, throughout the film, it's it's his, it's his colleagues that are to blame for his feelings in, in the crime world, you know, why there's leaks going out and stuff. But by the end, it's his own greed that ends up in... You know, in his in his in his death, ultimately, do you know what I mean? Like he by him wanting to kill, um, I think it's Wayne Grove. Like he ends up, you know, dying. Yeah, and uh, I I sort of agree. Uh, in, in you know the the relationship uh with Eddie, but you know, it it was also maybe their third date where he's like, yep, New Zealand. Let, let, let's be <laughs> let's be off. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, yeah, I know what you mean. I I was I was sort of like, you're a madman, especially after he had just like. You know, he had just pulled the bank job. He had just killed numerous people, and then he just like rolls into her house, like heads to the fridge. You know, gets himself a drink, yeah. and then and then he's just like, "Yeah, you know, you when when are we gonna head off?" I'm like, "How fucking deluded are you that you like walk in with the assumption that she's gonna want to continue your relationship after knowing that yeah. you're a murderer?" Yeah, I know, I know. Like one thing about this film, buddy, is you know I, I'm sure you've seen the the Graham Norton clip where Tom Hiddleston does the impression of yeah, the scene from this I film and i actually didn't realize like i was watching this film and then this scene came up and i was like just i wasn't sure that the tom hiddleston impression was from this film so i had to rewatch the interview midway through watching this film and i was like okay it's from heat so uh, i watched it and this film probably has the best one of the best cinematic scripts of all time like one of my favorite lines is like what am i doing i'm talking to a dead man in the telephone because it's this dead man at the end of this fucking line and i thought that was such a good line and obviously like the 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 restaurant scene with Neil and Vincent, it's probably a mar it's just a marvel of cinema in my opinion. It's so good. It's just two characters talking. Yeah, I ha- I had wondered what like which way you were gonna go. Like what whether you were gonna say it was one of the greatest of all time or or you know that it was I I, I don't know, sort of overhyped. But yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. It's definitely one of the one of the quintessential pieces of uh intriguing dialogue. Uh, and you know, I I think it was really nice to see that you know even though they have such huge differences, they set those aside so and similar, talk yeah. about their similarities. Yeah, they're so similar, man. To be honest with you, and you know, one thing about the only other Al Pacino film I've seen is Jack and Jill, um, uh, with Adam Sandler. And I, what, one thing I've noticed about him as an actor is all of his lines are like really like sort of low pitched, like uh, you know, sort of like really low pitched. But then a lot of it is just like out of nowhere. It's very like it's very ecstatic it's very like rah because there's what there's one line where um this, this guy goes why did i get mixed up with that bitch and then and then uh, al pacino goes because she's got a great ass and i thought that was absolutely hilarious i love that yeah i i think he must come from like sort of like the you know the old school style of acting you know when we watch films from, from sort of like between the 40s and the 60s you know it's a lot of like you're kind of like why is this actor so well regarded because they do sort of just speak quietly for a bit and then shout and I, th- I think that was most evident in say Citizen Kane you know obviously Orson Welles gives a fantastic performance but pretty much every side character is kind of just a easily replaceable character that I think either of us could easily play you know where you sort of just quiet for a second and then you shout the rest of your dialogue so whilst I think that he gives a fantastic performance I think he comes from that old school style yeah, of agree. acting even though he obviously does it well yeah if we were here to be um uh, Al Pacino or De Niro, who would you be? Which one of us would we be each? Oh, I mean, you know, uh, I, I, I guess of the <laughs> two of us, I'm the criminal. I don't, I don't know. You're, like, you're, <laughs> so you're, you're, more you're De Niro and I'm Al Pacino. <laughs> to be fair, like, you know, one is like a morally grey criminal, one's a morally grey police officer. So, I mean, neither are, you know, clean cut yeah, in sure. either yeah. of their archetypes. So, I mean, you know, I, yeah. Who would you actually, I guess be? I guess I'll make you the criminal because he's actually he's smarter than uh than Pacino. No, but I think I think I, I think you're naturally more. I think you're you're smarter than me, so I'd have to get make you. No, no one thinks that, Matthew. No, I get, think get, that, get, get I over think yourself. That. So, wait, what, what, what actor would you rather be? Like, who do you think is the better actor over Al Pacino and De Niro? Because a lot of a lot of people would probably say like they're both two of the best of all time. I would say like, who do you do? You, do you have a preference over the two? Because I, I I love them both, but. De Niro wedges it for me. 
Yeah, I, I would agree, De Niro edges it, because I, I think that he has broader range in the characters that he plays. You know, I, I would say role-wise, Al Pacino actually plays different characters. You know, he, he obviously, you know, can play the good guy or the bad guy, whereas I think Robert De Niro pretty much exclusively plays the bad guy. But he can also play a bad guy that you hate or a bad guy you love. So yeah. he has this huge spectrum, even in this, like, one committed, like, genre. Sure. Uh, so I I, th- I think I respect his his oh, breadth yeah, of acting time, talent more. Big time. Uh, but, you know, I would say my favorite thing about this film is the refreshing element where we actually see competent criminals like pulling off simple, concise jobs. Oh, uh, you yeah, know, because like when that. this is actually your career, you should be a lot better than every other like criminal in film. Mm-hmm. I agree with you, man. I agree with you. And 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 a lot, it's funny you say that, buddy, because in a lot of the heist sequences in the film, they're so well done. And and it, it, it reminded me of a lot of a, like a Christopher Nolan film, especially the opening of The Dark Knight. It's very similar to that, actually, because you know the criminals there, like the Joker gang, if you could call it that, they're very they know what they're doing. You know, they're they're very they get out of the money, they go out with the school bus with the money, and they get out of the bank. So. In this film, it, it really reminded me of a Nolan film, to be honest with you. I think Nolan was heavily influenced um, by this film completely. And um, you know, the Hollywood shootout in itself is fantastic. You can actually see what's going on. There's no jump cuts. It's just extended sequences of, of a shootout there, and it's fantastic. And, I mean, I have so much good things to say about this, man. It's just, I love I love films that you can just see what's going on. Like, don't get me wrong, I love Captain America, The Winter Soldier, but even I'll admit that film has way one too many cuts, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, and that that definitely. definitely works. It definitely works from that film. But for me, I prefer like a a film wherein you can actually see what's actually going on on the screen. Do you know what I mean, man? Yeah. How did you feel about the like incredibly long uh, shootout scene? And that you know, it's just it's just heavy gunfire for maybe twelve minutes. Yeah, I know. But it, it was so action packed for me because for a second I was like, oh shit, like they might like kill off Al Pacino or De Niro or something. Like, I thought that was interesting, but. No, I'm. I thought I'm, I was amazed. Neil and both Neil and Chris made out alive in that. To be sort of, I haven't really mentioned Val Kilmer's in this film, and this is the first Val Kilmer film I think I've seen. Uh, but apart from, oh, uh, surely not, Matthew. Surely you've seen Batman Forever. I haven't seen any. I haven't seen like any of the Tim Burton Matthew, Batman or anything. Buddy. Don't embarrass yourself with this. Yeah, I know. Well, how, how is this, How is this the truth? But yeah, obviously the, this came out the year after Batman Forever. I'm like how. Like, what a low point it must be to just, like, obviously this is <laughs> yeah. the far better film to, but, like, to move from being Batman to just wearing, like, a gross, like, blonde ponytail, and you're just like, what am I doing with my life? And uh, <laughs> yeah. Chris is actually, Chris, uh, played by Val Kilmer, is the only character uh, to make it out, like, the only criminal in the film to make it out alive, mm. and that sort of made me really angry, because I think he's the most inconsequential character. And he's by far a worse guy than Neil, and Neil is the one that dies. You know, I think, yeah. I think if if I this agree. film wanted to, you know, portray like karma or you know, you know, a, a sense of a sense of justice, you know, I th- I think it would have ended with his death because I think he is he's the worst guy left alive at the end of the film. You know, I think that Neil mm-hmm. is a much more redeemable character, and honestly, I think that the character is so inconsequential to the film, you could quite easily cut his character out completely no, and just save time. One, yeah. I agree. There's like, if you were trimming the script, take him things. out. Yeah, there's one too many, like, criminal informants in this film. There's one too many criminals for me. I think you could definitely cut a few of them out, most notably about Filmer's character. I think you're losing, like, a solid 20, 30 minutes if you just completely ax him from the script. Yeah, there's a lot of this film where, it, it, to be fair, like, I have given it a lot of praise, but one thing I might criticise it on is, like, it tries to give you backstory to Al Pacino's character with, like, he's in his third marriage, which is struggling, and then, you know, he's got, like, a a stepdaughter who tries to commit suicide. And I actually think that scene's really well done. You know, it really brings out a vulnerability in a similar sense to how it, that's mirrored through um, Neil and Edie's relationship. So I thought that was great. And you sort of see that their his third marriage is sort of mending itself again, which I thought was nice. But yeah, I, th- I think it mm. does, it tries, I think maybe it does try too hard to, to give Al Pacino some, some um, likability, I guess. Because he is a likable guy, but he's, he's, um, like you said, he's sort of like a, in that muddy grey area of, of, of moral compass food, I suppose. Yeah, and you know, by, by the end, his marriage does seem to be mending itself, which it shouldn't, because his <laughs> wife is the worst. Uh, let, let, me, let me just throw out, uh, you know, why, why I absolutely fucking despise his wife. Go for it, So, Go for he, it. he seems like a very good husband, a great stepfather to her daughter. Absolutely. She puts no effort, no more effort into their marriage than he does cheats on him and then blames him and you know she he he sort of says at the end oh i recognize that 
like I wasn't what you what you needed or what you wanted. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that you can betray your marriage. Like there's absolutely no excuse if they are a, a you know evidently good husband. She sort of says he's a bit t- detached. He's too committed to his work. He's like, yeah. you mean solving mm-hmm. murders? Yeah. It's like how selfish can you be? Like if you entered into this relationship, you know she she says you know, two thirds in the film or uh, at the midpoint, uh, you know, when they're dancing that she would love him regardless of what he does, you know, so love him whilst he's being, you know, a, a detective, like, you know, he's solving murders, you know, be like doing good for the community and you, you're spiteful towards that, you know, she, yeah, she's just a horrible, horrible person. Yeah. Do you think that's a bit of a, 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 a plot line that's running at that sort of big recurring I'm trying to think how it is. I think that's a plotline that's being overused in the sense that, you know, the cop is, the cop's always at work. So, like, the wife cheats on him or the wife leaves him. Like, you see that in a lot of cop movies, I think. I think it, I think that is probably just because it is, it is accurate. You know, yeah, that obviously yeah, that does true, happen. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, this film isn't trying to excuse her. You know, it, it, it's, it's not saying... You know, obviously, obviously, I recognize that she's a terrible person, and the film doesn't actually say anything to the contrary. You know, it doesn't it doesn't present her as a good person. So, so you know, I I can't fault the film for that. I'm faulting you know the character yeah. for her actions, not not the film for its presentation of the character. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, the fact that there's even like a glimpse of hope for their relationship, I think, is uh, much too, you know, you know, much know too mean, nice yeah. to that character. You know, I think I, I think agree, once yeah. your partner cheats on you, call it a day. No, a I, I think point. the trust is gone. Yeah, no, I agree with you, dude. I agree with you. Do you have any more notes, buddy? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, so, Matthew, I'd like to hear your rating in the film if you have nothing uh, else on it. Yeah, so I think the, the De Niro Al Pacino dynamic is so good. Um, the, it's some of the best, uh, some of the best um, line delivery ever and some of the, one of the best cinematic scripts I think I've seen ever. So, for me, 10 out of 10, 40 out of 40 for today, buddy. I loved it. Wow. Yes, I agree. It has incredible dialogue, incredible performances. It's tense. Uh, and engaging but it is overly long and i think you'd easily ask the character of chris uh, and save a lot of time so i will give the film a nine out of ten love that man love that like it's been overall it's been a good day of podcast recordings you know it's been we've had a it's been a good uh movie slate today we've all we've given them both well we've given all the films high ratings which is nice so um yeah um shall we move on to a little bit of uh future episode chat for the next coming week Yes, we shall. So we'll obviously be continuing our trend of uh, Disney films. So next episode will be Disney part seven. Seven, seven yeah. Uh, we'll, where we'll be talking about The Little Mermaid, Oliver and Company, uh, Basil Black the- Cauldron. What? Oh, yeah, and, ba- and Basil the Great Mouse Detective. So those are the four films we'll be talking about in the next episode. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, okay. I would say two out of four of those, I'm uh avidly uh excited for and then two i think i think Same. one will be all right and one will be bad i've heard the black cauldron is one of the worst films ever made <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh god worse than winnie the pooh sorry the many adventures of winnie the pooh well it was the it, it was it was made uh like it was completed and then disney said oh my god like what is this this is like horrifically <laughs> graphic you know oh they're, they're, they're like like oh my god, this is like this is so scary. This is not appropriate for children. And then the the people who made the film were like, oh, we'll just edit it. And they were like, what the fuck are you talking about? You can't edit an animated film. Like every every scene and shot is ex- is explicitly like you know constructed to to make a narrative. Like there's no like you don't have deleted scenes in an animated film because if you if you don't want it in the film, you're not going to waste the time animated it animating it. So they're yeah. like, oh, we'll just edit it. And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and then. So, so it apparently comes up like they did edit it, which is why it comes across as like a complete hack job. Oh no, I'm looking forward to that. There just to see what it's like now. That's gonna be okay. And then after Disney Part Seven, we'll ho- hopefully do Planet of the Apes Part Two. Yes, so we'll be talking about uh, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes and uh, what it, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, uh, and then okay. we'll be talking about the Tim Burton 2001 remake starring okay. Marky Mark Wahlberg, Marky uh, which Mark. I'm not looking forward to whatsoever uh because i think he is a dreadful actor yeah not a huge huge Wahlberg fan either but um, who ever thought he was like leading man material like you know so many michael franchises bay. have made that, that mistake you know yeah michael bay tim burton uh you know there has been one film where i enjoyed him and that was in instant family 
but I really think that was just because uh, Rose Byrne carried that film. Mm. Uh, and, you know, Isabella Monera, obviously, Dora. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Dora the Explorer, yeah. Yeah, you know, she, like, the, the two of them carried that film, and Marky Mark was sort of just by the sidelines, not pissing me off too much. So <laughs> I think that's why I tolerated him in that film. Yeah. But listen, man, it's been a pleasure recording with you today. As always, thank you again for introducing me to these four films. Thank you to everyone who's recently watched this episode. Please be sure to like, subscribe, comment your thoughts down below. We'd really appreciate it. And uh, stay tuned a little this week for Disney Part 7 and hopefully um, very soon as well, Planet of the Apes Part 2. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Callum. Take care and bye-bye. Bye-bye.